Professor Tarun Khanna, uh, who uh, from uh, uh, who is the faculty and research at the Howard Business School, and uh, this the moderating this session is Mr. Ravi Gururaj, founder and CEO of Leap My Logistics. Uh, Ravi and uh, Professor Tarun Khanna, please welcome uh, Ravi over to you for the discussion. So welcome to NPC, the virtual event for the year 2022. We are delighted to welcome uh, Professor Tarun Khanna from uh, all the way out in Boston today. Uh, thank you, Professor, for joining us at uh, NPC. Thank you, Ravi. Lovely to be with you. Well, perfect. And let me, before we get started, uh, just make, I know you're, you're, you don't need much introduction, but for those, we have a broad and big audience. Uh, those who are unfamiliar, I just wanted to kind of walk through uh, your background. Uh, you're the Jorge Paolo Limin Professor at Harvard. Uh, you're also the first director of the Lakshmi Mittal and Family South Asia Institute that works actively across India uh, and the, the entire Harvard community. Uh, you're a prolific author. I won't list off all the books, but uh, you know, you've, you've, you've focused on entrepreneurship in the developing world. Uh, you focus on meritocracy as it uh, serves as a framework for entrepreneurship uh, and with a focus in particular on China and India. Uh, you're also, uh, you've, you've taught a hugely popular edX course uh, on entrepreneurship in the emerging markets and how to scale that out. Uh, and you're an active founder in not just uh, around the world, but even in India uh, and uh, an operating uh, founder investor, right? Uh, and lastly, uh, you've been working quite closely uh, with the Indian government in many instances uh, to helping them uh, build out entrepreneurship, digitize and various other initiatives. So thank you for joining us, uh, Professor Khanna. And, uh, you know, I wanted to start off first with just asking you a broad question on the areas of, you know, your own passion and interest, uh, which are basically world class from India. That's the theme of our conference. And it's something that you're passionate about in all, it underlies a lot of the research you do and the initiatives you, you back is the opportunity that is India to build both brilliant services and products, not just for the for India, but also for the world. And that's the theme of our conference. So I would love to hear your perspective on that. Uh, uh, thank you, Ravi, for, um, for for the kind introduction. And it's, it's lovely to be with the NASCOM community after a few years. Um, uh, it's an amazing platform that you guys have uh, co-created. So it's to be with you. Um, so as Ravi, you say, I'm actually quite passionate about the role of the private sector and the role of entrepreneurs, uh, in particular, affecting change in developing countries. Um, that's sort of my starting premise. Um, and the reason I say that is that I think that sort of, if I may call it a Schumpeterian perspective, going back to a um, you know Harvard colleague uh, who predated me by some decades, uh, is an important um, corrective or addendum to the way people think about economic development in general, which is you know state-led, uh, having to do with macroeconomic and political stability, having to do with foreign aid and things of that nature, which India has you know embraced uh, to varying degrees in the past. Um, but I think the entrepreneurship story is relatively more recent, as you know, last couple of decades, um, maybe three decades, if you want to take it back a little bit. And it's very exciting to see it uh, come. To I also feel that we're sort of in the early uh, early years uh, of uh, uh, or the early I'm uh, mixing metaphors here, but early laps in a long marathon in some sense. Right. And so you know this is just the beginning of a um, of a of what I hope will be an efflorescence of creativity. And the last thing I would say is that um, uh, the world does look to India as a, as as a as a candidate role model. Not the only role model, uh, sure. but as a candidate role model for the developing world. Uh, being a democracy, um, and it's important that we retain that pluralistic uh, uh, creative uh, ethos. But being a democracy that also is able to play at the very highest levels of tech um, is, is, is a really promising ensemble of attributes uh, right. that is missing in most parts of the developing world. So we really have an opportunity to even project soft power in some sense. Uh, so that's why I spend so much time in India. Of course, I'm emotionally close to India because I was born and brought up there and uh, retained my citizenship and worked closely with the government and so on and so forth. Um, but really, structurally, it's an important uh, piece of the uh, uh, emerging world order, I feel. 
Awesome. So the, the I think this is a good segue into the next question I had for you in the theme, you know, about digitizing Bharat, right? And you brought up the soft power uh, topic. I think, you know, there's a lot of work underway both within NASCOM and across the government and the ecosystem on, you know, how you how you up level the, the level of tech, uh, not just at the top of the pyramid, but across the base, right? Uh, you know, you, you've worked a little bit with that. You've even studied it a little bit, you know. What's your, what do you see as both the opportunities which are clearly evident uh, and some of the challenges that we may face, right? In rolling this out and how we could be a role model to other parts of the world as well, right? Emerging world. Yeah, so um, I think as you rightly say, the, the digitization story, of course, coming out of all the amazing uh, companies that our entrepreneurs built in, the, in IT services uh, back in the 90s and even predating that with TCS and then with the new, newer generations of software companies uh, really put us on the world map. Um, I thought, uh, you know, Nandan and uh, uh, Ram Sevak and others and the, and the entire team, the amazing team that built uh, Aadhaar and the Unique ID, etc. Uh, then iSpirit um, and its cohorts uh, that are out there evangelizing even within India and outside. Right. Uh, extent to which tech can um, uh, smooth out transaction costs in the Indian economy. And, you know, I, the way I think about this is that we, we, we were so far from the productivity frontier. Um, if you define the frontier as being best in class in the world prior to all this digitization, and which, with the digitization, we have come uh, in some areas uh, very close to the frontier. In other areas, we've transcended the frontier already. And so there's proof of concept for what we can do, and it's really exciting. And in other areas, we're still significantly lagging. Um, yeah. But what that does, Ravi, you know, we're all entrepreneurs here, uh, or a lot of us in the audience, as I understand from this. <laughs> and I tend to see the upside in everything. You know, it's a glass half full and a glass half empty. <laughs> so good news about us being lagging in some areas, you know, take health. You know, I currently am a co-chair of the Lancet Citizens Commission for reimagining India's health with some amazing people, amazing commissioners. And we're trying to think about, uh, and, and there's some NASCAR members as part of that, uh, that ensemble of uh, my partners in crime in that, in that, in that journey. Uh, but, you know, health is an area where we're deeply lagging. Uh, and the tech story can play a hugely important role. And I think it's emblematic of both the, uh, the possibilities and the challenges that tech will face. And this goes to the core of this group's concern, which is how do we create products that are sensible, products and, se and services that are um, uh, digital in spirit and scope, uh, but also respectful of the social ethos and the, uh, and the community within which they have to be built. I think in health, you will see um, both the possibility and, uh, and the challenges coming to the fore. And I think the NASCAR community and others should embrace it uh, in different ways. Um, and if I could make a, 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 a another related comment uh, about your opening brief, which is this is about creating world-class products and services. Uh, I think there's, um, let me wear my academic hat as opposed to my entrepreneur hat for a second and be skeptical. Um, uh, there are some areas where we have, you know, to hit a sixer to use the cricket metaphor or hit the ball out of the park in the American parlance. Um, uh, including the Aadhaars and the uh, payment stacks and so on and so forth, UPI, et cetera. Um, uh, and, and in other areas, we're very far from the frontier. And I think one of the things that we should all be doing, those of us who are sort of tech evangelists um, and well-wishers, really, of the, the Indian ecosystem, as am I and are, as are you, uh, is call a spade a spade when something is missing. And so we need a much deeper focus on science and tech in the entire ecosystem so that we can create the next generation of NASCOM entrepreneurs also. Um, and I think our attention to science, right, is um, in the country is, uh, dare I say, a de minimis. Um, and it's something that we've just got to fix. And the tech community is ideally positioned to help evangelize this. Uh, and, the, you know, the, the, the amazing possibility here is that we have such amazing scientists in India uh, sitting, you know, right way, you know, I'm assuming you're in Bangalore. Right. Right in, I mean, I can, you know, count at least half a dozen amazing world-class or would-be world-class scientific institutions right. uh, that just need to be catalyzed and unlocked. And out of that will come just an endless stream of products and services. So that's a huge, in some sense, a missed opportunity over the last few decades. Uh, but it's it's an imperative going forward, right, to fix that R&D 
uh, machine, <laughs> some sense. I, mean, uh, I was just uh, uh, Bangalore uh, uh, a few days ago, right. uh, five days ago, and I went to see the Biocon campus, which I had not seen, um, you know, in ten years, uh, ten fifteen years, and that's that's a nice example, right, of products coming out that are in the life sciences. I mean, life sciences, I'm sitting in the life science mecca in the world, Cambridge, Massachusetts, in some sense. You know, every every global life science company has its R global R&D headquarters within a you know, five mile radius uh, of where I'm sitting. Um, and so I'm conscious of this, the life science revolution, which by the way, is digitally enabled. Right. Speak to the NASPAM uh, uh, system for a second. The life science revolution will be orders of magnitude faster than the revolution delivered by Moore's law. Think about that. You know, everything right. surrounding you right now is Moore's law derived. Right. Right? You guys know this, your, your techies and digital values and so on and so forth. Think about that change in the last 30 years in India and in the world. Um, and now, you know, go several orders of magnitude faster. That's the life science revolution that's coming at us. And we are not ready for it. Uh, Got it. So, that, that, so that's an amazing opportunity and you know just even imagining going at warp speed compared to Moore's law <laughs> that that's that's going to give life to so many opportunities right in concrete right i mean just think about it. i mean look at a look at a graph of Moore's law right, right. You can look it up and then look at look at a graph of the cost of genome sequencing right the cost of genome sequencing which is a canonical technology that underlies a lot of what's happening uh, in life sciences, the cost of genome sequencing is falling at a rate orders of magnitude faster than the Moore's law-driven improvement in productivity of uh, the transistors. Um, Got it. And it gives spring to so many new things once you you get that done, right? And uh, can articulate. Uh, right. So. Absolutely. So you've hit on healthcare, you've hit on life sciences as two areas of opportunity. Are there others that you think, you know, we should be paying attention to where we've given short shrift in some sense in the past? And You know, I don't know that we've given short shrift. The other ones, you know, at least the really good news is that, um, if, again, if you just look at the Bangalore ecosystem or the, you know, the, the Delhi ecosystem, um, even five years ago, it used to be mostly... IT enabled services, some cloud-based stuff, um, mobile, uh, mobile enabled or mobile delivered business models, etc. Now you're seeing a lot more in, uh, you know, in uh, IoT. You're seeing a lot more in smart robotics. You're seeing uh, a lot of ag tech. There's a little bit of a uh, excess euphoria about ag tech right now with uh, insane valuations. The way the community tends to do it, which is go nuts for a while and throw money at something and then there'll be a shakeout. Um, so I get it, but that's the time-tested way of uh, societies to direct resources at something that has hitherto been uh, undervalued and unrecognized. So, so you know, when you when you say ag tech, uh, robotics, drones, you're starting to see activity in a broader, broader um, um, spectrum of uh, things than used to be the case five years ago. And I think that's the right trajectory. Um, so I, you know, if I had to pick things that we are not doing, I would just leave it at healthcare and, uh, and life sciences, which are massive swaths of things that we're not doing. But other than that, I think we're on a, in a, on a good, on a good wicket, as they say, and we should, we should sort of keep at it. Um, Got it. As, as we're still discussing the macro picture, maybe one last question on that area is, you know, what do you see as enablers the government should put in, in terms of policy changes, any, any recommendations from your studies elsewhere, both the US, China, you know, what do you, how do you juxtapose India's thing, right? Uh, uh, posture in those areas. Well, I think, you know, again, it's more good news than bad news here, uh, in my view, in the last few years. I think, you know, long ago in two, late 2000s, 2000, well, after 2005 sometime, I wrote a book comparing, you know, use, using my travels in China and India as a foil uh, for really comparing the two countries. Um, because I'm a comparativist at heart and that was a sensible way to go about things. And I made it made, uh, made a point of going outside of, you know, Beijing and Shanghai and outside of the main metros, uh, learn the language a little bit uh, to try to immerse myself. And uh, in, in that book, I pointed to, uh, it was called Billions of Entrepreneurs, written a long time ago, still, still very much in print if anybody's interested. Um, 
Um, but in that book, I pointed to the pros and cons of different approaches. And the spirit of that was to say that there isn't one approach that necessarily dominates, that there are pluses and minuses to different ways of doing things. And that what India should be doing is borrowing the good parts of what the, what the Chinese do and leaving aside the bad parts of what the Chinese do. And one of the good parts is that the, the state, such as it is, and the private sector, such as it is in China, really work hand in glove. Uh, and one of the things that we're seeing, uh, again, catalyzed to some extent by the tech community in India, is that uh, the government in India and the private sector have started working uh, hand in glove. And it's very exciting to see. Um, uh, I played a very small role in putting putting into place a framework for entrepreneurship in, uh, in India, uh, uh, thanks to a report I uh, had the good fortune to chair in the mid in the middle of the last decade, 2015 or so, which resulted in the Atal Innovation Mission in Niti Ayo, which I think has emerged as, uh, thanks to the people running it, no thanks to no thanks to me or my committee, but the people running it in Niti Ayo are just first rate, they're world class. And they are putting an infrastructure to put, you know, these tinkering labs in high schools. I think they're up to 10 or 15,000 schools across the country. Uh, they cost almost nothing. But they change people's mindsets for how to do science, how to make products how to be responsive to social needs. Um, uh, they create a literate workforce. that, of course, is the bedrock of any societal change. Uh, but the bigger point that I was trying to make is that the government and individual uh, private sector actors are finding ways to work together in a way uh, that was not the case uh, when I was growing up in India, or was not the case, frankly, even, even uh, two decades or a decade ago. So that's very exciting. Absolutely. I think, you know, uh, while there are some challenges and opportunities that we may have missed, I think just the future holds dramatic opportunity, right? Uh, and uh, you know we're very optimistic, like you are. <laughs> we should we should be looking forward. I think Absolutely. This is Absolutely. Option. So let's come back to the ecosystem now. You're an active investor. You're on a couple of boards here in India. Uh, some of the large, you know, unicorn companies as well. Inmobi, uh, shared alumnus there, Naveen, uh, who runs that company, and. Uh, you know, Chai Point as well, which happens to be another alumnus, I believe. Uh, and uh, so, you know, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what insights you've gained, right, from both those investments and watching those companies operate and scale both within India and now in some cases outside, right? Yeah, so they're, they're, they're very different stories. Um, um, uh, both my both my, both my my students, Amlik Singh uh, and uh, Naveen Tiwari, uh, very different. One is from the get-go built as a global global business in Mobi, and the InMobi group now with Glans and Proposo and a bunch of other uh, amazing uh, digital properties within it, each of which I think uh, uh, is uh, more than a unicorn. Um, uh, and Chai Point, which is a consumer-driven, uh, problem-solving, on the ground, right now purely in India, but poised to go global. Um, both very different. Uh, I think both emblematic of the idea that we have uh, so much human capital that if channeled in the right direction uh, in India, uh, these two happen to be uh, uh, people educated first in India in engineering institutions, in very good en engineering institutions in India, one of the IITs in one case and one of the engineering colleges in Punjab in the other, uh, and then Harvard Business School. Uh, but honestly, it could apply to anybody. We see this at Axelor also. Axelor is a project okay. in uh, JP Nagar, Koramangla area, that uh, I also have the good fortune to be a co-founder of with uh, a bunch of uh, ex-Infi people. Uh, you will know Chris and Shibu from the local community. Um, but there also we see so much talent, you know, and it's every bit as good as the Harvard guys. Uh, maybe better in uh, many ways because they're more sort of anchored uh, Ravi, am I allowed to say to the Harvard Of course, of course, Harvard. of course, yeah. of course. So we know that. So. <laughs> Thumbs up to that. <laughs> <laughs> amazing people, amazing people. And we're finding entrepreneurs, you know, from uh, Bhubaneshwar, we're finding uh, entrepreneurs from Raipur, we're finding uh, entrepreneurs of Aurangabad uh, coming into the, into the tech ecosystem. And really what entities like Axelor um, are creating uh, is, a, is a landing pad. Um, and there are many more, like, so, you know, and more power to everybody because it's so much room for so much room for growth. One thing you asked, you know, what have I learned? One thing, and again, uh, skeptic hat now as the academic to be straightforward and honest. Uh, one thing that we do not do well, going back to the science lacunae uh, in the country, 
is uh, we have not, as a community, and this is a collective we, including you and me, Ravi, and a bunch of others in, in the diaspora today, we have not uh, had sufficient ex ex experience to price intangible assets appropriately. Let me expand on that because it's very important. Um, the minute, so if you go to our private equity community, it's changed a little bit in the last 18 months, 24 months, but I think it's still still very much the way I will over-characterize it in the following sense. Uh, it generally wants to invest only in completely de-risk things. It doesn't really, the venture capital in India, private equity, it does not take risk. Uh, it just does not. Um, it wants somebody else to take the risk and then it will invest, which is fine. Uh, it's sort of more middle to late stage private equity. It's not really venture capital or risk-taking private equity the way I understand it from the Cambridge Mass ecosystem. And what that means is that you, uh, as an entrepreneur, you kind of have to have your system pretty much de risk, right? So I'll give you an example. Let's take Chai Point as an example, right? Um, so we have an amazing product called Boxy, uh, Box Chai, Boxy.in, which is really a world class, actually world class robot to deliver customized chai on the cloud, linked 24 7 globally in a sort of ISRO style satellite <laughs> monitoring device, supply chain optimized, uh, everything. It's really world class. Now, if I were to go, I have not done it, but if I were to go to a VC in India and say, fund this as a standalone entity, right? They would say in Hindi, kitne kap chai veche, right? How many cups of tea did you sell? That's a wrong question, right? Because now you want to reduce it to a tangible asset. How many cups of tea did you sell? If I go to a, a consumer tech VC in LA, um, uh, in, in, in Boston, you say, what's the idea? Let's imagine what this thing is worth. Let's price that intangible idea. Right? And it's a riskier proposition, but that's the point. Uh, that you should, we, we need to develop the expertise to do this. Right. Uh, now it takes time every year, and it's not that you know, the US or Tel Aviv, you know, came up with the way to do this overnight, but we are in early stages of that journey. And what that means is that really cutting edge products and tech that are still at the risk stage uh, are likely not to be developed in India currently, right. unless we find ways as a community to, to expedite that process of learning how to price intangible assets. Uh, right. So I leave it at that because I think that's a challenge uh, and a massive, massive opportunity. Got it. I think you bring up an important point there. I think, you know, you, you would get some friends of mine in the investor community who'd want to debate you on some of those points. But I'll <laughs> yes, leave that I'll leave that for another day <laughs> and another know, venue. <laughs> the point but, is to, you know, to uh, throw a challenge out to... Absolutely. Uh, I get the point. And I, I think... Gone. Yeah, and I think the long gestation deaths are still a, a few and far between. Uh, but I think that, that even that is improving over time uh, with each new cohort and each new fund. And uh, as you see, successes come out, right? I, I, I agree. I agree. I, you know, um, I mean, the impatient part of me always wants it to be faster. <laughs> uh, and to be clear, I'm not saying that if I were in the positions of these private equity guys in India, that I would not be doing the same thing. Uh, it's the incentive system within which they're operating that leads to that and it's a collective project for all of us to figure out how to do much better got it so i'm going to squeeze in one or two last questions before we run out of time here uh, one is you know a lot of our entrepreneurs in the audience today are probably looking at the global entry entering you know a market either another emerging market that's mm -hmm. near and close <laughs> uh, and has similar characteristics or a totally advanced market like the us or europe that might have very different characteristics, right? And uh, different barriers to entry and opportunity. Any guidance there from all, you know, the, the, the entrepreneurship you studied around the world, uh, how should they approach it? I think it's the, the, uh, the right answer has got to be, it's going to vary a lot. I mean, in some cases, if I go back to the Chai Point example, there really hasn't been a need to be outside India at all. Uh, the opportunity is more or less endless, just in our backyard. Um, uh, I mean, we, we have started to do things globally, but it's not necessary. You can build a very valuable, very socially productive company employing thousands of people just sitting in the backyard. So it's not, it, I don't think it should be an imperative. Uh, on the other hand, I looked at, I look at some of the, uh, there's a company in the Axelor portfolio. I'm not, not going to remember the names very well, but one that I do remember is Detect Technologies, 
which is sort of a, I think it came out of one of the IITs. It's a, it's a, it's a local scientist in India who uh, we were able to back and uh, it's a global play right, right from the get go. Um, and I think there you have the whole spectrum. You've got you know, the local consumption driven, which by the way is booming in India, as you know, um, post COVID particularly. And, uh, and then the global, but that, that dichotomy of business model has been true for time immemorial, right? You had the software companies that were uh, doing things in India for the rest of the world from the get-go. And then you had uh, locally oriented companies who were building equally valuable or more valuable companies locally. So I don't think that's changed. I think both are uh, frankly equally promising uh, to my view. Uh, and, th and what I would say is that, uh, you know, uh, the you know the Indian ecosystem is littered with the carcasses of foreign investors uh, who came by you know and so is the Chinese ecosystem littered with the carcasses of foreign investors who came by you know seeking the alleged billion consumers to do this and that and when we go to other countries when we go to local South Asian countries or Southeast Asia or Africa uh, we should be mindful that we don't end up as the carcasses uh, it. because it's the same sensitivity that we need to. To, to, to display that is sometimes missing when uh, foreign investors come into India. So you need to be measured and, you know, uh, in your approach, obviously, uh, when you enter these markets, yeah, even the, idea, the markets you think that map closely to India. <laughs> you know, the, 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 uh, there was a nice book that came out of our teaching uh, that Krishna Palapu and I wrote called Winning in Emerging Markets that actually took seriously the proposition that emerging markets as a class are distinct from, uh, let's say, the U.S., um, in terms of the institutional maturity of facilitating creative enterprise. But it also took seriously the proposition that within emerging markets, uh, market A and market B and market C have very different institutional foundations. And you need to start by mapping. So in that book, as I remember, it's a decade old now, we provided a very simple taxonomy uh, that I wouldn't say is the only way to go, but it's certainly a starting point for anybody interested. Got it. As, uh, so thank you. That was great. Uh, you know, just as we close out, one last question. I can't, uh, uh, you know, I, I'd love to, as an alumnus, understand what you're doing with Harvard in India. You've been a champion for lots of faculty research and enabling that through uh, the Lakshmi Mittal Center as well. And could you just give us a little bit of flavor of that as we close out? Um, sure. Um, so we, you know, I, I, the, as, as, you, as you alluded to, there, there are two aspects to it. There is my role as a Harvard Business School professor, which is sort of my home faculty at, uh, at Harvard University. And we've had a Mumbai Research Center uh, for a very long time. Uh, it's in uh, these days in, in Parel, uh, in Mumbai, very vibrant. It's got a full team of, I want to say, 15, 20 amazing people run by an extraordinary lady, Anjali Raina. Uh, and they act as the intellectual travel agent for Harvard Business School faculty doing work in India and South Asia. And they're just simply extraordinary. So anybody interested in connecting, Anjali Raina is the person to go to in Mumbai, uh, easy to find on the web. Uh, the second effort is something that the previous president of Harvard, uh, Drew Faust, had asked me to create, which was really, in a sense, a replication of the, of the HPS effort, but at the level of the entire university, reporting to the, uh, to the president, provost of Harvard. So I'm lent by HPS to the university to build what has eventually become the Lakshmi Mittal and Family South Asia Institute, endowed by my friends, the uh, Mittal family in London, the steel, the steel uh, industrialists. Uh, and that's a full spectrum effort to get faculty from medicine, law, philosophy, the humanities, mathematics, uh, from across the university involved in India and South Asia in many ways. And it's firing on all cylinders. We have an amazing office in the heart of Connaught Place, uh, near the Imperial Hotel, uh, that you're welcome to connect to if anybody's interested. And I think the reason it, it might be important even for NASCOM people is that good products are made uh, within a social milieu and a, and a, and a social political context. And really, the scholarship that is enabled and catalyzed by the Lakshmi Mittal and Family South Asian Institute uh, is trying to get that ambiance front and center so that the, the, the products and services that those of us who are entrepreneurs are out to create really fit in and contribute uh, to, to the milieu in India and are seen as productive. Uh, are not just productive, but they're seen as productive in our literacy. Uh, so it's very exciting times for us at the university and in India. 
Very good. And I hope, you know, we'll have more cases on product companies out of India at HBS uh, that will get studied. Uh, you know, this is our aspiration to go world class from India and uh, be kind of the gold standard, right, for products anywhere. So thank you very much, Professor Tarun Khanna, for joining us today at NPC 2022. We very much appreciate your time and insights. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you.